The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. God's eternal purpose. I believe that Ephesians was written from a perspective of God and it was written to a mature church. And quite frankly, the Ephesians were living in a realm of relationship that we're not. So we need to aspire to say, God, reveal to us what Paul was trying to relate to them and bring us up closer in experiential knowledge. But because Ephesians was written from that perspective, from God's perspective to a mature church, he was basically revealing his eternal purpose. I've watched people get shipwrecked trying to figure out their dream and their purpose. When in reality, if you tapped into the eternal purpose or God's purpose, you would get on track quicker and see your dream and vision come to pass. Seek first the kingdom, all those other things would be added. So in the, to the Ephesian church, God's eternal purpose is to express Himself in humanity through many sons. Now ladies, that includes you, your sons. Men, when it talks about the bride, that's you too. So there's no confusion, all right? Men and women are the bride, right? Yes. And the sons, multiple sons of whom Jesus was the only begotten to the firstborn. How many are aware of that transition? He was the only begotten to become the firstborn of many. That's the eternal purpose of God, to bring many sons to glory. And ultimately, the most mature level is that Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The maturest level for the body of Christ is when there is a corporate expression, not individual, corporate expression of when you've seen us, you've seen the Father. Isn't that beautiful? Hmm? That's kind of like the father receives a vast family of sons. That's the eternal purpose. Sons and daughters ready to take over. The Holy Spirit receives a temple of living stones. Now remember, this is a mature church. In the mature church, they understood living stones was not a heap of stones. It was not, you are living stones individually, but you're just a heap of stones. He's not talking about that. He's talking about a level of maturity to where those living stones came together and became an expression of the manifold wisdom of God, the church, the congregation, the called out to assemble people. Called out of darkness to assemble. Interesting. You're not a church until you assemble. It's a requirement. Now, in that called out to assemble, the Son actually receives a glorious body for His expression, the bride. So the Son, in the ultimate expression, receives a bride without spot or wrinkle. The Holy Spirit receives a temple. Now you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit individually. But the eternal purpose of God is for a full expression. He's looking for a body that will be a temple of the Holy Spirit. That would require a level of maturity and uh, a lot of your dysfunction would have to be dealt with, wouldn't it? Even to be a family. Come on, no crazy uncles allowed. You got to get it out of your system so that you can relate to people. All right? Is that vision too high? I say it's probably too high for the way people are living experientially. But just because it's higher than what we are experiencing doesn't mean that we shouldn't be praying for a spirit of wisdom and revelation to enter into a far deeper level than we are currently at. All right? I want to. I want to cover some of that with you this morning. Um, I've given you the big picture. This is, for me, this is a download of Revelation. 
that you will be hearing it from multitude of speakers around the world. You're going to hear some themes. A theme is, is kind of like a thrust, not an extreme, but a thrust means there is forward movement throughout the body at large with individual members with diverse gifts and talents. But when they express themselves, you're going to hear certain topics again and again and again. That's a thrust versus an extreme. A thrust that I believe is coming is holiness. We've seen it experientially in this fellowship. Holiness is going to be clarified. It's going to be like the sons of Zadok who basically are going to have to teach, this is clean, this is unclean. And they're going to do it by discernment, not by some kind of legalism. All right? Uh, the holiness will teach the three levels of the cross. And just because it sounds too hard, teach it anyway. Because when it sounds too hard, it's because you're thinking in your mind, I can't do that. You're not supposed to be able to do that. Apart from him, you can do nothing. All right? So the three levels of the cross will be a repetitive theme. Love will be a repetitive theme, but it will always include the holiness of God. Because that's where it's gone astray in culture. Love, 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 love. And then they love sin. They love everything. All right? That will have to be clarified. The second, and this, this one, I, I'm really looking for a major download in this. I've seen tastes of this in the past. Even in my first pastorate when I was only 29, 30, 31 years old, I saw a measure of that. I saw a unity to where uh, what, what we had up on the pulpit one time. I was teaching that the blessing is in the cluster. And if we were to put a silhouette up here of a single grape, it wouldn't be as identifiable, would it? If it was just a silhouette, you'd say it could be a penny, could be a grape, could be a cherry, could be, you know. But if I put a distinct design of a cluster of grapes, it would be unmistakably clear. God wants that unmistakable clarity in the expression of unity. Not unity, that's project unity. Spiritual unity that is an orchestration of God by the Holy Spirit to where divine appointments come together as divine connections. Divine connections start to, and this is the word of the Lord, come into a divine alignment or order, whatever word you want to use. Alignment or order. God is orchestrating that. That's something that you can cooperate with, but you can't make happen. More often, man makes a structure and then tries to plug stuff into the structure. When in reality, everything that's ever worked in all the years I've been in ministry came about organically based on the kind of people he brings to you. Their willingness to participate, and there's a coming and a going based on willingness to participate, and connection. But God will ultimately have a cluster. In my first church, somebody, after teaching about the cluster, for, I, I used the example of a raspberry instead of a cluster of grapes. And a raspberry is what they call an aggregate. You know those little nodules on a raspberry? But it's all one raspberry. Various nodules. Well, my first pastorate up on the platform, somebody made a huge... I don't know if it was plaster of Paris or what it was. They made a huge raspberry and had everybody's name on a nodule. I guess they wanted an object lesson. And, but that kind of unity is going to take place in the body of Christ. There's, there's a supernatural union and communion that I believe we're going to enter into to whosoever. Now that does require you doing two elements in your personal life. Die to your agenda... What's an agenda? Any idea or goal that rises above obedience to God because you want it done. Your way. That's an agenda. And what is at the source of that agenda? Issues. <laughs> we used to call them sin. Um, <laughs> sinful. Because it's idolatry. An agenda can be idolatry. God's got a plan for your life, but He always brings it about organically. And I'm, I was always amazed. Even uh, early on, people have a tendency to want to copy something that's working. When in reality, if it was grown organically, you can't copy it. You have to grow your own. The 
unity that I saw that God's basically saying is that we're going to produce like a Gideon 300. And everybody gets blessed even with the Gideon 300. It has an impact for the body at large. You know, Gideon's 300 won the, won the battle there in the forefront, but all of Israel got to join in the blessing. That's a proper attitude. The, so it's holiness as a thrust, unity as a thrust, revelation of the Father. I am thoroughly convinced that we're going to see a revelation of the Father. Historically, there's been a revelation of the Holy Spirit. There's been a revelation of Jesus. And those revelations need to continue experientially in our lives. But there's also a revelation of the Father coming that's not going to be like your earthly father, good or bad. It's going to be a demonstration to where you're going to be at a level of the cross to where you have his consciousness most of the time. I believe the fourth level, and you're going to see a lot of this, and lately I've seen it, and I was excited. I'm excited when God speaks to me something by myself, and then there's multiple confirmation throughout voices throughout the body of Christ. That's healthy. But it's going to be reformers. As much as we're into revival and revivalists, and that's a good thing, the emphasis is going to be on reformation. The revival can stir up the church, but ultimately reformation impacts society. And he's looking for a people that are individually in the marketplace impacting society. And reformers are not uh, going to do, they're not going to be bullied. When I worked in the factory, I saw that and I was kind of glad. Uh, I worked in a factory and they would find uh, Christians and they would purposely swear, cuss. They knew all the buttons to push, so they would do it excessively. And I watched Christians cower from that. And I'm going, oh no, I gave up everything for this life. I'm not doing that. And so I basically took a different approach, a more aggressive approach. I think the day's going to come, and I wouldn't do it my way because I was a baby Christian. I was kind of crude in my efforts. But they'd be cussing and swearing, trying to see if they'd get a reaction out of me. And I'd go, all that God stuff, do you talk about God all the time like that? Why don't you leave that God stuff at home? Did you learn that in your church? Where where'd you learn to pray like that? And you, and you know they're using the Lord's name in vain. And I said, where did you learn? But when they found out you can't be intimidated, you actually win their respect. Yeah. It's basically, did I get them all converted? No. But I'll tell you one thing. They respected me even if they didn't become Christians. As a matter of fact, when uh, I changed jobs, when I was just a baby Christian, it was in a trucking firm, and they had drug dealers and people that did a lot worse than that. And uh, when I left, they were so uh, paranoid about Christians that when this next guy came in, they said, take my job. They go, you Christian? And he goes, yeah. They watched him for about a week, and they hung up on a hook, a hook that takes truck engines out. They hung him up there, and they stood around and mocked him and said, we had a Christian in here. You're not one. Because they, they caught him smoking pot in the, outside with the rest of the truck guys and everything. So you water it down, and you look like, you know, you're gonna, if you're going to profess something, you better be able to stand there. But I thought that was interesting. I mean, they, they literally, unsaved people, said we had a real one here, and I'm sure I wasn't perfect. I did some crazy things in there when I confronted them. Like one time, he took an expensive watch off. My car had patches to cover the rust <laughs> with rivets. I had a patched vehicle. I had just gotten saved. I just got off drugs. I needed a job. I was cleaning toilets for less than minimum wage, I think it was. I don't know how they did that. And they came in, he says, he took his watch off, and he goes, so you're a Christian. He smashed it against the wall. He says, I can buy another one. What's your God do for you? Look at your car. It looks like it's got cancer. It won't even pass Pennsylvania inspection. What's your God do for you? And so I go, oh, yeah. 
I knew he had pride issues, so I just figured I'll feed on that a little bit. It felt like the Lord just gave me that little download. And so I said, oh yeah, well, what have you ever bought from me? And I had free Bibles that you're not supposed to sell. <laughs> Give me 10 bucks for this Bible here. Or are you afraid of it? I'm not afraid of that. He, he bought a Bible from me and later on was willing to go to a Christian uh, luncheon where I was the guest speaker. I was to give my testimony. He sat next to a guy who you probably know him. He's been in Charisma Magazine and everything. He sat next to him and he sat next to another guy and this guy saying I was in a helicopter crash and, and I died and was raised from the dead and this one the guy, and he's sitting there like this. <laughs> He's going, is everybody in this room crazy or what? You know, but it's basically going to take the wimpiness out of our Christianity and really stand for what we believe uh, and not cower. And I believe those days are in, and God's looking for reformers. It's wonderful to have an experience when you're with all believers, but how do you behave when you're out there in the world where, they're, where the majority are not believers? That's where you need to create the atmosphere. So those are the four elements that you're going to see a repeated, I mean, throughout the body of Christ. Holiness and the love of God. Really a deeper experience in the cross. Love, but not love apart from holiness. You're going to see more of like the, what I call the Zadok priesthood. You're going to have teachers that are going to teach that which is clean and that which is unclean. We need that taught because so much of it is trying to uh, soft sell different items. I just love it because if God, if you can see it, then you can believe it. You need, first of all, to see internally properly before you can believe properly. And so I'm praying, Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1.17 as the word of the Lord for this congregation. Uh, if, if you open your Bibles to that page, uh, you, can, <clears throat> you can see um, what that prayer has to do with. Now this is praying for the Ephesian church. Chapter 1, verses 17 to 21, that the God of our Lord Jesus Messiah the Father of glory, might give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, so that, I always like it whenever there's a so that, so that you might know what is the hope of His calling, which are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of that power toward us who believe. I believe that prayer is still powerful then and it's still powerful today. And God's basically praying for wisdom and revelation. He's praying, first of all, how many know that to break free from head knowledge, that wisdom is the ability for you to perceive in your spirit, right? The carnal man, it's, spiritual things are foolishness, 1 Corinthians 2. God has given us a spirit and it's the spirit of man that knows the things of God because the spirit of God reveals it to him. And that, that, that wisdom is basically a beautiful capacity and it's the wisdom of our Father. Doesn't the scripture say if anybody lacks wisdom, ask? The wisdom that comes from God is pure, peaceable, full of mercy and good fruit. All other wisdom, and you might pride yourself in some of that other wisdom, but all that other wisdom is sensual and even demonic. So, the Lord was dealing with me this week on that in the beginning was the Word, and He was full of grace and truth. I just love that grace. Grace is the presence of Jesus within working in our lives so we can obey God's commandments and meet His standards of holiness and love. That's what grace is. Grace is also the personal presence of Jesus empowering you to be and to do all that He called you to be, all that He called you to do. 
Grace is also the ability to not sin. Many of you may have heard of uh, uh, <clears throat> Watchman Nee's protege, Witness Lee. Have you ever heard of Witness Lee? Slip up your hand if you ever heard of him. Well, anyway, uh, Witness Lee was one of his disciples, profound insights into the scriptures. And I like reading his commentaries because his commentaries are coming from a level of maturity that far exceeds a lot of scholars. Matter of fact, those of you who have ever got your degrees in theology, there are some people you studied that didn't necessarily know a whole lot about the Holy Spirit, right? But I'll tell you, reading, reading some of the things he said, grace is Jesus, the person of Jesus, as our enjoyment. Think about that one for a while. Grace, that's experiential. That's not something for your head. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus for our enjoyment. Wow. See, for me, his will is his pleasure. I cannot separate the will of God from his pleasure. But I don't believe Jesus did. I delight to do your will. You, if you see the will of God as drudgery, you back into legalism and carnality. Because the only thing that you should be experiencing in the will of God is that when you even hit a challenge, it's like, oh boy, I'm overriding that, going over the top of this one. This challenge is an opportunity for me to triumph because God always triumphs. And you start looking at challenges from the resurrection side, right? I want to, I want to do a... Uh, something that uh, God spoke to me this week, and if you're going to write anything down, write this down, to know. We, we can lose people in the body of Christ just on that word know. In the Greek it's genosko, if I pronounce that right, but that know is intimate knowledge, okay, not head knowledge. And I really believe God's going to bring us and honor that Ephesians 1.17 prayer where he's going to give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. We're going to start getting downloads of experiencing Jesus in the revelation instead of more head knowledge, more head knowledge, more head knowledge. Learning and learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Here's the, uh, the things that I saw that really struck me. In understanding knowledge, intimate knowledge, it has three parts to it. All right? Inception, there's a beginning. Inception then has progress, and progress has an attainment. You know when you equip the body for the work of the ministry, it's actually perfecting the body to the work of the ministry, perfecting them in the love of God, maturing in the love of God progressively till they attain it. We often use that word equip as mending. Well, yeah, how do you mend us? Basically, to increase that love until we attain mature stature. Fullness of love. But here's, here's what I want to say. Inception, progress, attainment. Inception, progress, attainment. I want to give you the three levels of the child, the young man, and the father just to challenge us to move in there utilizing those three aspects. I speak to you, this is in 1 John chapter 2. You're all familiar with that part? Because you're going to hear a lot of it because God's trying to get us to progress. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. All right. I get it. I receive forgiveness. I'm a born-again believer. As a matter of fact, I could do what the Gospel of John in chapter 20 and Luke chapter 24 says. I can now go preach the forgiveness of sin, couldn't I? Once you're, the minute you're born again and the blood of Jesus cleanses you, you could go preach that, couldn't you? Because you'd be preaching out of your experience. No matter how nominal, minimal rather, that, that experience is, it's good. You could go preach the forgiveness of sin. As I have been sent, so I send you. Go preach the forgiveness of sin. John 20, Luke 24. Now, okay, so I got saved. What if I'm one of those strange people who wants to move 
above and beyond that. I speak to you, little children, because you've learned how to forgive from the heart and not the head. I just saw it on Facebook again. Don't, don't try to get your theology from Facebook. It'll drive you crazy. I just saw somebody going, just forgive and live with the pain. Just believe, just believe that you forgave. That's mental assent. No. If you forgive, there is a supernatural transaction that changes to peace. He takes your pain and your sorrow. And Matthew 18 says, unless you believe from the heart. So all that, well, just believe. It's sad to see people struggle with something as simple as forgiveness. When I speak to you, little children, your sins are forgiven and you don't know how to do it. Do you know what a large portion of the body of Christ does not know how to forgive properly? Where's that at? What level are we at? Little children. I want, I want what the early church had. And so I don't care how impossible it sounds. I'm hungering for revelation and grace to get there. And that should be our attitude. And not just compare ourselves amongst ourselves and say, well, I'm doing better than Ralph. <laughs> you know, Ralph might be barely saved. All right? Don't compare yourself like that. So I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. Now, we said there's an inception, there's progress, and there's an attainment. I believe that that attainment prepares us to believe God for a deeper surrender and a deeper work of the cross and go to another level then. If it's children, young men, and fathers, by golly, there's got to be another level for me. But the progress, have I been proficient enough in the basic to actually be a candidate to graduate? Is my consciousness, that means what you think about most of the time, me, myself, and I, because that's still a child. It's all about me. It's all about my gift. It's all about my talent. It's all about my life. It's all about my family. And even when I love somebody, it's to make me feel good. <laughs> Is it valid? Sure. You've got to start somewhere, right? I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. The progress will be have you gotten to the point where forgiveness has become a lifestyle? We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people. That's, that shouldn't be. And besides that, it's available. Once you know how to do it from the heart, it should be as natural as breathing. Nobody should be bummed out for more than, more than an hour in any given situation. If you're bummed out more than an hour, the problem is you. Because the grace and the reality, grace and truth, Jesus is available and he didn't go anywhere. I had to learn that my temper tantrums were not making my point more vivid to God. I thought I was really making a declaration. But I found out that all I did was prolong the agony and increase the power of the agony. Torment. Right? But when I learned that if you forgive quick, the torment goes quick. Oh, maybe that's a better idea. So there is progress even in, I speak to you little children. There are many people in this church, if you were honest, you learned to forgive here. Hmm? You knew it conceptually. But in reality, you had to make that transition from the head to the heart. Now, the progress would be to walk a forgiveness lifestyle. The challenge even at that level is not only a forgiveness lifestyle, have you gotten to the point to where it's quick? And not only is it quick, but you're learning how to resist temptation. Oh, do you realize if you learn how to resist temptation, you don't have to ask for forgiveness? What a milestone of accomplishment. Seriously. You can get proficient at being a forgiver to such a degree that when an offense comes, instead of being a poor victim and sucking it in and then crying about it later, come on, you all cry. I've seen, it. I've seen you. <laughs> you get your feelings hurt. You're rejected. You know, you can be proficient at forgiving and still be a victim your whole Christian life. So you got proficient at forgiving them. That's nice. That's progress. 
but it could get better. I taught a little teenage girl how to do that when she was being bullied in school. Those caddy girls were coming up to her, inviting her to a party, and then telling her, you can't come. And she wanted to be in with them. And she's going, I know how to forgive, Pastor Dennis. I know how to release it. But it's happening every single day. I'm missing something. And I'm going, yeah. I says, you're still a victim. You're real good at forgiving, but you're getting beat up all the time, every day. Then you got to forgive. You're taking it in, it hurts. Then you got to receive forgiveness to get rid of the hurt. Then you take it in, you receive forgiveness to get rid of the hurt. And I'm believing for fathers. This is still childhood stuff. This is baby stuff. This is, I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven. And you've got to learn to walk this. Do you think we're a long ways from the early church? Yeah. But these are the necessary steps for graduation. And we all need this. So you go, okay. I says, the next time you go see those girls, out of your belly flows rivers of living water. Before they say anything and it comes into you and you're wounded, then you got to forgive them, beat them to the draw. See them coming, drop down your spirit, and I let a loving river of forgiveness flow. Um, actually, you're releasing loving intercession the way intercession is supposed to be done. Out of my belly flowing love toward them. And while they're being catty, you got like a fire hose of God <laughs> blasting them. Dirt can't go in a fire hose that's blasting. So you're blasting them like this. And she said, while she was blasting them, who was ruling in that situation, by the way? Greater is he that is in us. Oh, oh my goodness, it actually happened. The greater one in us actually is working. How desperately do we, because we can quote these scriptures and we don't do them. But here's a girl who's doing it in a hostile environment, no less. This was in school. Can you imagine that? Wow. That's pretty much like the jungle. And she's blasting them with love. But here's the beauty of it. Not only is greater is he that's in her, but while she's blasting them and she's releasing loving intercession to them while they're being catty and while their words were cruel. She didn't take it in and have to forgive them, did she? But guess what the Holy Spirit did to her? She said, you know what the best part? While I'm blasting them, the Holy Spirit felt like he was turning my head and there was a table in the cafeteria of girls and she said, I just walked over. They were all Christian. They had all been praying for her. But she wanted to be with the in crowd of the bad girls. And she finally found friends that really meant something, but the Holy Spirit let it. While she was in a place of victory, you get guidance. If you're busy, everybody's speaking on me. You don't know what's going on, to tell you the truth. You're preoccupied with me, myself, and I at that moment. So I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. You've, you've had the inception. You got the revelation here. Many of you got it here. You got the revelation, the inception, but then it required progress, didn't it? You had to practice by reason of use. You need your senses exercised. So then you practice forgiveness and you found out that it works. But you want to go to the next level even in a child level. What's the next level in a child level? I'm going to start releasing the love of God aggressively or you could even call it forgiveness in advance. <laughs> Prevenient prayer, they used to call it. Pray ahead of the devil. And you're in a hostile environment, you go, oh, Jesus, we'll show them, bless them before they even open their mouth and say anything harmful to me. I'm releasing love to them right now in Jesus' name. Uh, and you don't even have to say it out loud because if the door of the heart is open, God's peace will guard your heart and junk can't come in and penetrate the peace of God. When the scripture says the peace will guard your heart and your mind, that's not poetry. It means it'll guard your heart and your mind. You lose your peace, you're a wide open candidate for the enemy to come in and r run roughshod over you. All right? So I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. You've overcome the wicked one. The Word of God's abiding in you strong. You're practicing 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I'm walking in that light. Wow, I got a handle on that. I'm a forgiver. And not only that, now when I get bummed out, it only lasts an hour. Tops. Not days and weeks like it used to. Not seasons of depression. Which, by the way, depression is usually anger toward yourself. Something you want, you can't get. Somebody's doing something you don't want them to do and you can't control it. 
They're either doing what you don't want them to do or they are not doing what you want them to do or whatever. It's frustrating you. Release control. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him, not to you. God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong. God is able to make them do as they should. Romans 14.14 14 in the Living Bible. 14.4 in the Living Bible. Now, I'm getting proficient. By golly, we're not going to we're not have a, anything but proficient children in our church. Now I've gotten so good at this forgiveness thing that peace is guarding my heart and my mind. Peace is both passive, resting, but peace is also assertive and it'll crush the enemy beneath your feet. And so I see it all of a sudden I'm resisting not doing this. Did you know that nine, talk about I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven, 98% of the church, any church, when they're in a hostile environment, the first thing they do is this. Uh-oh, uh-oh, they're so-and-so. Uh-oh, you know what this is? You close the door of your heart. You're in self-protection. Self-protection means God's not in it. I'm taking matters into my own hands. I'm closing the door of my heart. How does that work? It means the enemy. That's the enemy's door. That's fear. Fear is the wrong kingdom. He has access now. He can say hurtful things and they're going to go right in you. Just like gossip. You might hear it in your ear. But gossip is basically tasty morsels that go down into the innermost parts of the belly, down in the seat of the emotions. This is where in the heart it's going to begin to fester and make you sick. Now, I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven. You learn how to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle. Now, oh my goodness, now you've gotten to the place where you're finding out, I'm not forgiving so much. I don't have to. I must be changing for the better. I must be cultivating character somehow. It snuck up on me. I see fruit. I'm seeing handling stuff that used to cause a meltdown. Now they irritate me. The things that used to irritate me now don't bother me. There's something internal that is transpiring in that it's considered pure joy when you suffer various trials because if it produces something, it produces, there is a leftover deposit of the divine nature that remains inside of you and you grow in the grace and in the divine nature or the knowledge of God. There's an inception, there's progress, and there's an attainment. I'm telling you, if you as a church have got this down that good, you need to pray for the second level, don't you? Young men and young women. Young men and young women, it is no longer me, myself, and I. You don't even say, I got sick. We. Sickness has come upon us. Level number two takes a work of the cross. And I want to pray for revelation because you can't believe properly until you first see it. Level two, what we'd call a young man or a young woman, is basically someone who scripturally you say, it is no longer I that live. And I don't mean quote it. I'm talking about living it. I'm talking about experiencing it. I'm saying, I'm going to surrender until it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. The life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God. Wait a minute. I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. He's living His life through me. I'm a yielded vessel. This is the will. I yield my will and surrender it so that even at this stage, any temptation, and there's brochures back there, any temptation is to pull me out of that oneness. You have appetites and desires within that rise up and out there the world, the flesh, and the devil wants to pull me out from that union and operate independently. I want to see a body of believers that no longer even have a consciousness of operating independent of Jesus. When he died, you died. When he was raised, you were raised. 
When he ascended, you ascended. The revelation that must take place internally is that it is no longer I that live. This life that I'm living, you will always be a self. So you don't even kill self is probably not a good term. Deny self. You don't kill it. You'll always be a self. All right? But self gets denied to rule and come out from that union. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. You are at second level denying your self from coming out and doing what you want to do. Protect yourself. Give a smart answer back or whatever. Okay. Huh? I want that so desperately. I know that I know it's an experience that's real. And I know that I know it's available. But it's, it's a work of the cross. There has to be on your part a sincere desire to deny self at that level. And deal with any fear that would inhibit you from dying to that level. Now, I know by the Spirit many in this church had that transition point. But I watched almost everybody struggle with the progress afterwards. So where does the training need to be? If you've graduated and said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me, I understand the replaced life. I have to Learn just like the forgiver. Didn't they have to learn? First they had to learn to do it from the heart and not the head. Then they had to learn to do it. When I was first learning forgiveness, it's kind of a backtrack, I told God I don't think I can do this because I have so many dirty thoughts in my head and opinions that I have to go to work. I can't concentrate on me asking for forgiveness. That's a pretty bad kid, don't you think? I'm going, God, this is a full-time job, me asking for forgiveness. Everything irritates me. I want to control everything, and nothing's working right. Nobody's doing what I want. I want to be general manager of the universe. That's what I'm campaigning for. <laughs> but I have to keep asking for forgiveness. This is too hard. And thankfully, by the grace of God, I didn't give up because I knew that's what he was telling me, and it seemed impossible. So if any of this sounds impossible, it's because you're eliminating with you. <laughs> yeah, it is. But you, there's grace being made available for this, no matter how impossible. And all of a sudden, the thing that kept me going was the progress. All of a sudden, I saw that what I was doing constantly, forgiving, it got just a little bit better. <laughs> Can you get excited if something got a little bit better? For me, that was motivation. Okay, no, I'm not doing this really that well. But it got a little bit better. And that, how that translates for me, it works. It works. You, give, you put something in my spirit and say, this works. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to lay hold of that. And all of a sudden, I saw it then it got farther and farther apart. And that was part of the mastering of the forgiveness. But that's still, I speak to you little children, because your sins are forgiven. Plus, I had to overcome my background. My background was Catholic, and I only knew the confessional. And I knew that if I went and confessed to the priest, if I told him everything, I would have this penance and punishment that was that long. So then I would only take part of it. But then when I only said part of it, I would leave guilty that I didn't tell the whole thing. It was a real catch-22. So anyway, when I found out that Jesus, I could go to him and get that forgiveness, that was actually quite a relief. You realize that? All right. Now, young man. The young man is strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, and he's overcome the wicked one. If you are truly in the young man stage, it's we consciousness, yes, but you also walk in victory. I'm not talking about in a church gathering. You walk in victory 24-7, and you've overcome the wicked one. And people are attracted to victory. <laughs> I never went for a depressed person to get prayer. Do you? <laughs> it's just not logical. It's just, they need prayer. All right? 
So now, as this young person, you've overcome the wicked one. The word of God abides in you strong. And in the summer of this year, God says, for Kingdom Life Church, I am bringing in that the living word is going to rise up in each and every individual. That the word of God, see, when I used to teach that, I saw the word of God abides in you strong. I meant they were biblically literate and they knew Jesus. No, no. Jesus says, me, the living word, is going to fill them from head to toe. And it's going to be an us, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Do you see a transition? How many did what I did? And the word of God abides in them. So you interpret it based on your level of revelation. You interpret all scripture based on your level of revelation. I'm being challenged by Ephesians because those people had it together. And he was probably talking a whole lot of stuff for us that are above our heads. That we're going to need a spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's why I want to pray that apostolic prayer. I want to pray it for me. I want to pray it for you. Because we're living under the potential, the beautiful maximum potential of what God has in Jesus. And so I don't want to be the loyalist that gets stuck at a comfort level and be an old wineskin that can't budge. I don't want to be an opportunist that says I've got some revelation that nobody else has and see if I can't make a name for myself or make my cut out my little piece of the kingdom. I see that. And you know, that's one of the things I don't like about <laughs> discernment is I get wounded when, when, when I can perceive that in a leader that they're an opportunist. How many know what an opportunist is? You know, by definition, right? We won't go there. And then there's old wineskins that can't change. Can you imagine the, 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 the man who gets, uh, starts moving in the gifts of the Spirit but was a good evangelical who wrote a book against it. Can you imagine what dilemma he goes through? My book is out there, and they're using it as curriculum. In many churches, perhaps even Bible schools, that says we don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit for this generation. I wrote that book, but now I had an experience in God. What do I do? It'll put them in a place of pressure. Some cannot relinquish, and I know that for a fact. Once your structure's in there, it can become a crystallization and a hardness. We've got denominations because of that. And I'm saying that what God has taught us is how to bring a person into recovery and emotional healing fast and don't apologize for it. Are there more complicated structures to do what we teach? Of course. Can you do it faster? Yes. Now that's coming from, not pride, that's coming from a God confidence that it needs proclaimed. And if you can't proclaim it, what are you going to do, hide it under a bushel? But I'll tell you what, you people have the tools and you're learning the tools progressively on how to get people from the doldrums of their Christianity to standing on their own two feet, not seeing you as the source of grace, but seeing that the Jesus in them is more than sufficient to cause them to stand on their own. Yeah. To me, I won't ever apologize for teaching people to stand on their own two feet. I'm sure there's people that would rather be the total source of grace and be the expert and be the only one that can do it. But you know, quite frankly, that's a perversion of the young man. The young man sees himself as an instrument of God. Watch what I can do. I see people on TV that the emphasis is watch what I can do. I'm more impressed if what they do can be multiplied from little children to adults. Can they be blessed by the process? Can they draw closer to God? Can they be equipped or perfected to do the work of the ministry? Not Five-fold ministers are supposed to perfect the love of God in you to mature so that you can do the work of the ministry regardless of where you're at in the, in the world. School, business, arts, entertainment, no matter what mountain you're uh, called to. But God is basically saying that I speak to you, young men, 
because it's a consciousness that Christ in me as me. Um, living in a victorious living and the word of my testimony is the testimony of Jesus. Yeah, I, I, getting to the place where I only do what I see my father doing, I only say what I hear my father saying. And it also requires speaking the truth in love. I'm, I'm seeing a generation of, in the church that's being so affected by the culture that they won't tell somebody the truth. And you know the rule of thumb in the church used to be, and I did this, I'm not doing it anymore, but I did this, and that was as soon as somebody told you in your jurisdiction, God told me, I back off. Do you do that? When somebody tells you God told you, you kind of, I'm getting to the place if I don't witness it, I'm going to start telling them. Well, I don't witness that. And maybe they'll go to prayer about it. I've never done that before. Because I'm always teaching people to hear from God for themselves. So it sounded like a contradiction. But in reality, are you going to watch people walk off a cliff? Is that love? See, I don't think if you don't speak the truth, you don't have the love. Speak the truth in love instead of watching them walk off cliffs. Now, the key would be when you speak the truth, you still release them to make their own decision. They don't have to agree with you. But I don't think it's love. How many friends? Hmm? When we saw that woman come out of a lesbian relationship and get totally set free to where she said it's like coming out of a dream, all of a sudden it's coming into clarity. Do you know that Jennifer and I were the bad guys because their friends knew but said, I chose not to judge. You also chose not to do anything redemptive or loving. You also chose to keep them trapped. They're calling that love? Speaking the truth in love is going to be that, you know, we've got a long ways to go as church. And the sooner we recognize that and take that humble approach that God... I, I, Grant unto me a spirit of wisdom and revelation because there's things you spoke to the Ephesian church about the eternal purpose of God that quite frankly, it's, it's beyond my experience and it's beyond the experience of the church. But that just because it is doesn't mean we shouldn't be going for it. Right? I want to see, I want to see, let's get to the place where the young man, the young man graduates to that place where it's no longer I that lives. And we saw many of these people accept that replaced life. But the progress has to be learning how to not operate independently of that union. And so anything you're tempted with, you learn to deal with it as a temptation. If you blow it, obviously you receive forgiveness, right? And you repent. But I'm saying that the progress comes when you start recognizing that that there is a level of holiness that is coming from that union, that love union, love and holiness, to where it's not anywhere near as easy to sin as it was. Experientially. That's progress. And all of a sudden you're seeing that you're dealing with temptation more than you're asking for forgiveness. You're seeing stuff pulling at you, but you're saying, I am remaining in Him. And it goes all the way back to a truth that God gave me as a baby Christian, only now He's amplifying it at a much more mature level. As a baby Christian, I would close my eyes and I'd feel His presence here, very mild, not lightning bolts, very mild. And then I shared this before. Then I would see a picture of my foreman. And down here it went, <clears throat> and the Lord very lovingly said, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. I saw it not as, an, as a need to forgive, yes, but I saw it as something interfering with my relationship, which was to be a constant, not a touch from God here and there, but a constant embrace or union. And that's one of our first books, How to Practice the Presence of God 24-7. It's from here, not here. You commune from here, spirit to spirit, even while you're sleeping. You can, you're communing with the Lord, spirit to spirit. And 
I saw that forgiveness removed the obstacle, yes. But I also noticed that it was coming between me and Jesus. And I learned that peace is the indication that there's nothing coming between us. So right now, if you feel nothing down in your gut, Jesus is ruling. If you feel uneasy feelings in here, you need to receive forgiveness, release forgiveness, do whatever. But if there's no uneasy feeling in your gut right now, Jesus is ruling. That's lordship. That's letting the peace of God rule experientially. And here's what else I noticed. That when I forgave that foreman, I stayed there for a little while. It changed to peace, but I stayed there anyway. And I felt like on the other side of that forgiveness is a river flowing out of my belly. There is a river of love. And I saw that must be what you do when you intercede. After you forgive, forgiveness is love. But after the barrier's gone, after the pain, the hurt, the grief, after that's removed, what's flowing out is pure. And that's loving intercession. So then, no matter what you say with your mouth, that is the source. Because I've seen people intercede in fear. Oh, God, please save my daughter. And the whole room felt like fear. That's not going to save your daughter. Get in the place of peace. And let the love flow. And release salvation to that daughter. Creating the presence, the source, the source. So the young man, there's an inception. There's a work of the cross where you accept the replaced life. You quit bad-mouthing yourself. That's a good thing that happens in the replaced life. Child still talks bad about themselves. The young man and the young woman basically says, I'm God's man, and says it without pride, but a God confidence. I'm God's woman. I'm God's man. And from that place, my life in trials and tribulations is that all temptation is tailor-made for you, by the way, so that you can be stronger. Do you know everybody's temptation is tailor-made for you? The enemy knows your weakness, but also it's something for you to overcome and get strong in. We haven't even get to the fathers yet, have we? Does it sound like we've got a ways to go? Jennifer taught on the third level, but I think it's going to sink in that what God's waiting for is an inception. And that inception is going to need progress. In other words, you've got to grow in it by reason of use. There's an instant that's beautiful. Everybody loves the instant. But after the instant, even people that I've seen get dramatic healings, I noticed that how they walked it out after the healing was very, very dependent upon how much progress they would make. What about people come forward? I got a backache. I need healing. Nothing happened. They go back. I said, I got a backache and I have somebody pray for me for healing or I do it myself. I hold my heart open till whenever. <laughs> I am not shutting down. I hold my heart open. I'm not in charge of the timetable. And you know what? You make progress. Through faith and patience you receive the promise. Biblical patience is nothing more than not shutting down because you didn't get something instant. If I hold my heart open and go, oh, I'm still open for God to do His work progressively, but I'm also building character called patience and it's through faith and pay. Everybody wants to have more faith. I'd rather be in the second level where I've got the faith of God. <laughs> got to die to some of that old terminology. Or if you're, if you're still miserable, just believe you forgave. I couldn't believe I saw it on Facebook, posted by a leader. Just believe you forgave. Uh, that's like Jesus going, they're not really nailing me to the cross. I believe this is not happening. Mental assent and believing from the heart are different. <laughs> if you believe from the heart, you're entering into the newness of life. 
an inception, a progress, but there is an attainment to where you can then move forward at a higher level and a deeper work of the cross. Let's, let's pray for us as a church. And there's several apostolic prayers, but really, um, I think we got to start where we got to start, Ephesians 1, 17. We can't get beyond this. We pray right now, open up your spirit. I'm praying that this prayer is still valid for me, for you, for the body at large. I'm praying right now that the God of the Lord Jesus Messiah, the Father of glory, would give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of my understanding would be enlightened, that I might know what is the hope of his calling, now that pertains to me, right? His calling. But listen, what are the riches of the glory as His inheritance in the saints? He has an inheritance in us if we fulfill our eternal purpose. What's His inheritance? Well, the Father gets many sons, a family, of many sons and daughters who've come unto maturity. Jesus, the firstborn, what about the son? He gets a bride. What about the Holy Spirit? He gets a temple of living stones, not a pile of stones. Living stones that have learned to relate properly one toward another. And the only way that's going to happen, probably save that for next week, is a, the body is going to have to die to the six C's. You are still almost in plague season with the six C's as a believer. No matter how mature you think you are, do you still complain? Do you still compete? Do you still compare? Do you still conceal? Do you still control? You know, they, we don't even talk that gossip is a sin. We don't even talk about that no more. We kind of take it for granted that everybody does it. <laughs> well, guess what? They died in the wilderness for those seas. Every one of those seas I mentioned are in the wilderness experience. Aren't we supposed to use that for reproof and for correction? I'll tell you what, our pastors mean, we meet on Sunday night, the most beautiful thing about our pastors mean nobody complains. If there's a situation, it's because they're part of the solution. Nobody complains, nobody competes, nobody compares. I wouldn't trade that for anything. I know we got unity at that level. Do you know how beautiful that is? No compete, no compare, no criticize, no conceal, no control. I don't want anything to pull us out of that relationship. I believe that God's preparing a Gideon 300 who want to pay the price, count the cost and pay the price, to enter into a place to where they, don't you want to be that unnamed person when, when God says, I've got 7,000 who have not bowed their knee. Don't you, want your, don't you want to be included in that? But you know what? I'll bet there was more than 7,000 Christians in that city. What do you think about the other ones? That's scary to me. What if there was 14,000 Christians and he said, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed its knee? I'd want to know if I was in there. Wouldn't you? We're going to be the man. So Father, we just pray that Ephesians 1.17 a spirit of wisdom and revelation for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.